Now, I believe we typically do not like rules. Why? Because rules, they confine, they restrict us in many, many ways. But what about those kinds of rules that protect our interests? Well, what about the rules of God that put things in order? Now, that was exactly what God had in mind when he gave his people laws. He meant to put things in in order because in the sinful world where sinners live there's a lot of chaos there's a lot of disorderliness and god has his people not just one person's welfare in mind but the whole community of the covenant god has their welfare in mind when he gave his people the sets of laws that they are supposed to follow and so god always tell us in the bible in different uh, wording that if we follow god's law it will go well with us and our community. And so God has given us the Ten Commandments. Now, if you think, oh, we have just finished with the Ten Commandments, why are there even more laws coming our way? And that is why, that's what we're going to understand today. With the funda fundamental Ten Commandments, why is it necessary that God still give us a, a many others? many other laws for us to understand his heart. Now, last week, if you still recall, I introduced to you this term called covenant code. In other words, another name for covenant code is the book of the covenant. And this covers the contents from Exodus chapter 20, verse 22, which we covered last week, all the way to Exodus chapter 23, verse 33. And now, before we talk about the contents of this covenant code, what do we understand as covenant? Now, I think a lot of us, we like the word covenant because we are called to be children of God's covenant. So what is so lovely about covenant? Because covenant, especially the covenant made with God, made by God, they comprise of binding promises of God's truth, God's faithfulness, God's love, God's grace to people who belong to Him. And so what is covenant? Covenant means binding promises. And especially when this covenant is made with God, it will be a truthful and faithful one. Because why? God will always be faithful to whatever He has promised us. And why the name covenant code? Why do you think we? Uh, why do you think you know there's this term covenant code? Now code brings to mind what what code. Uh, very often we associate code with laws. So covenant code just means that Israel's laws, the laws given by God to Israel, came as a result of the people of Israel entering into a covenantal relationship with God. Not just a relationship, not just a temporary relationship, not just a relationship that can change, but a covenantal relationship with God. And so covenant code, it just means that Israel's law are not derived from human standards, human tradition, human thinking. You know, the laws in Israel is not made up by humans based on what humans think is good, is right, is best because we know that human standards are not perfect and human we keep changing our definition but here when we talk about covenant covenant code it highlights to us that this set of laws comes from god the perfect god with perfect righteousness himself and so when god gave his people this covenant code this code prescribed the code of conduct it, uh, in other words this is a set of rules a set of guidelines that tells us how God wanted his people to live. And why did God give his people such instruction? Why? Because if you still recall, you know, just now in the responsive reading, what do we read? We read that you know, those who belong to God should by right reflect who God is. And who is God? God is a good and holy, righteous God. So if you recall just now in the responsive reading in Exodus chapter 19, you know, God told the Israelites, and God said to him, if, if you obey me fully and keep my covenant, then out of all the nations, you will be my treasured possession. And although the earth is mine, you will be for me, what? A kingdom of priests and a holy nation. So people belonging to God is not just ordinary people. They are supposed to be holy to reflect who God is. And so uh, it also, uh, I think today's topic and from now on, as we start this covenant code sharing, I think it ties in very well with our recent reform training class. So just now, you know, during the prayer, we heard that yesterday we started our reform training class and the, and the theme of this is Christian ethics. So I think it gels well with the covenant code because why? Uh, from God's covenant code, it also helps us understand what is God's ethics? What does God sees as right or wrong, good or bad? Now, so 
from this whole series on this covenant code, one important thing we will learn is about God and His character. No, how righteous is God? How loving is God? How holy is God? So we will learn about God's character. It's not just a whole set of you know, black and white rules and regulation, but we learn about who is this God that we are worshipping. And so uh, when we talk about this covenant code, I just want to highlight one important difference between the covenant code and the Ten Commandments. Now the Ten Commandments, if you still recall, I mentioned Ten Commandments is a set of what? Timeless commandment, commandments. Meaning to say, Ten Commandments, they are moral in nature. So although it's given in the Old Testament, even today, while we are living in the New Testament, we are supposed to still abide by the Ten Commandments. However, you know, I also mentioned last week that Covenant Code, what are Covenant Code? Covenant Code applies, applies the principles derived from the Ten Commandments into specific situations found in the Israelite community. So in other words, you, you see that you know, sometimes whatever was mentioned in the covenant code may not be fully applicable to us today because we have different contexts, but it gives us important principles that we can draw from also. So for example, you know, just like I mentioned, covenant code is applications of the Ten Commandments. Now, for example, the Ten Commandments in the, in the Eighth Commandment, if you still recall, what does the Eighth Commandment mean? tell us or teaches us. It teaches us that we should not steal. But what does, what does it mean? How does it play out? What happens if someone really steals? How do we handle that offender? And how do we you know, reconcile everyone together? So in the Covenant Code in Exodus chapter 22, we read about specific laws pertaining to the circumstances of stealing. So you see, stealing is very broad. But stealing can happen in a variety of circumstances. What you steal, is it how, how valuable, how expensive the things you stole? And what is the kind of punishment? What is the time of the day that you do the stealing? All these matters. So for example, in Exodus chapter 22, over there, verse 1, we read, Whoever steals an ox or a sheep, and slaughters it or sells it must pay back five head of cattle for the ox and four sheep for the sh four sheep for the sheep. Now you see, oh, it's, it's all about stealing. But you notice the punishment is a bit different. Why is it that the ox and the sheep? You know, if you steal an ox, if you steal a, a sheep, why not? You know, you pay back the same number. You know, steal an ox, you pay back five. Steal sheep, you pay back pay back four. So why is there this difference? So it's about application. So from here we know. Uh, it makes a difference on the value of the things that a person steals. Because ox is more expensive. Because ox, you know, they are usually farm animal. They are they are to plow the land. They are you know they, they are working for the owner. So if it's missing for some time, or it's, if it's stolen, or if it's killed, it's a lot of it's a lot more loss to the owner. But the sheep usually you know just eat grass and then being slaughtered. So it's it's, it's slightly different. So we see that you know, even in mapping out the kind of punishment, uh, all these are practical applications that God gave his people. You, know, you have to consider the weight of the offense, the severity of the offense. And then also, for example, the timing of stealing also matters. So verse 2 to 3 in Exodus chapter 22, if a thief is caught breaking in at night and is struck a fatal blow, the defender is not guilty of bloodshed. But if it happens after sunrise, meaning daylight, the, def the, the defender is guilty, guilty of bloodshed. So these are some practical situations, you know, because at, at this verse I mentioned before, you know, if it's at night, you know, someone, you're trying to catch the thief in your house, you cannot see clearly and you accidentally kill him, uh, then you're not guilty. But if it's broad daylight, you can see clearly and, you know, you can bring him to the authorities uh, in proper procedure, but you didn't do that, uh, then you're guilty. So there's a lot of considerations. And so these are practical, for example, practical applications of how the Eighth Commandment of not to steal is to be lived out. And so God is like telling people, you know, just to tell people do not steal is not enough. We have to tell people, so how do you handle... Uh, the thieves, what do you do? And what happens when you know there, there are such situations that arise? And so, again, I mentioned the Ten Commandments, they are fundamental principles that never change. Uh, they are timeless. However, the Covenant Code applies them to specific situations, specific circumstances in people's life, especially in the Israelite society. 
And so, again, I mentioned, because these are very specific to the Israelite community, today when we are in the New Testament, when we read this same code of governance, uh, not governance, code of covenant, we may not find everything applicable to us because we don't have sheep, we don't have ox, you know, we don't have uh, certain things that the Israelites people have, for example. But we, one thing we need to note is, although as we read through the covenant code, you will see that the example listed in the covenant code may not be exhaustive in listing out all possible scenarios in life. However, one thing is very important, that although this covenant code, the example it listed, uh, cows, sheep, killing, or uh, men slaughtering, or whatever, the examples may not be fully exhaustive to represent all possible scenarios in life. However, it is a comprehensive enough guide to how, on how to handle various situations in life, such that, you know, if anyone with a good dose of common sense, you know, you have a, if you have a good level of common sense, when you just read through all these examples given in the covenant code, you will roughly get a sense, you know, of what God would like you to do in your specific situation. And this covenant code, why is it useful, the applications given there? Because we have to all recognize when God gives a word, a word is just a word, right? For example, God says, love your neighbor. What do you mean by loving your neighbor? It is a very broad, very abstract terms. You know, how do we know uh, if I do this, is it loving the, the neighbor? If I, do, if I do that, does it mean I'm loving the neighbor? What is the definition of loving the neighbor? You know, a lot of times, even in, our, even in modern days, as we hear a, a, a sermon, Sometimes I get feedback, you know, oh, you know, I know the gist of the sermon. I need to guard my heart, you know, I need to uh, resist temptation. But a word is a word. We face a diverse real realistic situations in our real life. How does it play out? You know, when, when you say, for example, love your neighbor as yourself. But then you say, okay, this is just one principle. But you say, oh, no, but you know, in my life, I've, my neighbor is like this. You know, the character is, character is like this. This person, my neighbor, treated me in this bad way. This neighbor is so inconsiderate. This neighbor is unadorable in, uh, in particular ways. So how does it play out? So for example, uh, we, we talk about, you know, loving our neighbor as the fundamental principle. And so if you love your neighbor, you shouldn't be stealing, right? So, but then what happens if a, already a person stolen something? So how do we love our neighbor and give the victim the justice, yet not treating the offender too harshly or too leniently? Now, if God didn't give all this guideline or application example, no people would just either you know handle the, the thief too harshly, oh, you stolen, put to death. But this is too harsh and a, a punishment for the kind of offense that he has committed. So God needs to give us a sense, you know, how much to punish, you know, how, and if you don't punish the thief, for example, just now the example we read about stealing, if you don't punish the, example, uh, the thief at all, saying, oh, we, we know we need to love our neighbors, even if he has stolen something, it's all right. But if you don't punish at all, it is not love to the victim. So you need some level of justice. But yet you cannot overdo that punishment. Otherwise, you're not loving the offender also. So there's a lot of nitty gritties, a lot of nuances, a lot of things to consider. And also, for example, in today's, um, in today's uh, context that we're going to read later on about uh, servants and slaves. Now, if you say, love your neighbor as yourself. Now, say, for example, a very common scenario we always encounter. If our neighbor is poor, if our neighbor has no money, how do we love our neighbor? Uh, does loving our neighbor means, oh, you're poor, you're no, not enough money, I give you handout. I give you cash handout. Every time you need money, I just give you cash. Is that the way to go? Even in the modern day time, we know. If a person is poor, it's not that helpful to keep giving the person cash every time he comes to you, right? It's better to help him make a living. So to love your neighbor, is it, is it better, for example, if the person is poor, find him a job. Or let him serve you as your servant. You protect for him. You care for this person. Provide lodging. Provide food for the person. In the course of this, train him to work on a job so that he has the skills for livelihood. So what is meant by you know, loving your neighbor? And so today, as one, one of the first example in this covenant code, last week when we talk about the covenant code, God already uh, tell us you know, how do we worship him. We cannot worship him together with idols, we must worship God exclusively. We shall have no other idols beside God. And God last week also told us in the covenant code that, you know, how we should set up the, 
the altar, it should be made of earth and we should put our sacrifice on the altar uh, to atone for our sins and so on. So this week, God talks about, so last week when God first started the covenant code, he talks about loving God, honoring God, you know, in terms of uh, no idols, in terms of uh, the importance of sacrifice on the altar. Today, God turned his attention to loving men. And the first example he quoted was on how to treat servants. And so today we read from Exodus chapter 21. And so here, over here, God told Moses to tell the Israelites. So verse 1, These are the laws you are to set before the Israelites. If you buy a Hebrew servant, he is to serve you for six years. But in the seventh year, he shall go free without paying anything. Now, I think this NIV uh, maybe makes us feel better because they use the word servant. If you look at other versions, you know, like uh, ESV, like NASB Bible, they use the word slave. But so, so the Hebrew word for servant can also be translated to slave. But here, uh, it's not just any other servant or slave. It is a Hebrew servant, Hebrew slave, meaning to say it is someone who belongs to the covenant community. It is not just someone from the outside pagans or you know outside uh, Gentiles. Uh, it's not someone outside God's covenant. It's someone within the covenant community of God's people. And so God's emphasis here when he gave this instruction is he already expressed his heart. Now, even if you have to buy a servant from one of your brothers, remember, he is one of you. He's your family. He belongs to this covenant community. God wants his people to love their brother, their own people. And so that's why in the seventh year, the Hebrew servant can just go free. And note, note that when the servant goes free, the master cannot demand any redemption price for the freedom of the slave or the servant. Okay, verse 3. And this um, if he comes, if the he, the, if the servant comes alone, he is to go free alone. But if he has a wife when he comes, she is to go with him. Now verse 4 is a bit, uh, some people when you read, you may find it a bit strange. But verse 4 here, if his, ma if his master gives him a wife and she bears him sons or daughters, the woman and her children shall belong to her master and only the man shall go free. Now, when you first read this, you'll be okay. when we read verse three, we find it very natural. Okay, if the man comes uh, alone, he goes free alone. If he comes with the wife, the wife goes with him. But verse four is the tricky part. You know, when you read this, you you may find this a bit cruel. Why separate the whole family? Why only allow the man to go free, but the the wife and the children remain with the master? So here is where we need to consider the background. Now, sometimes when you read the Bible and it conflicts with your idea of why a good God allowed this, you must always start from the premise that God is good. He always has good reason. So we have to consider the background of the Israelite ancient society. So the back, background then in ancient Israel is what? You know, when a woman is to be married, usually uh, the one who is marrying the woman have to pay a bride price. Now just think about it. If the servant is to get a wife, do you think the servant can afford to pay the bride price? Of course not, right? He's a servant. He's still owing money. That's why he, can, he has to be a servant. So naturally, who is the one paying the bride price? It will be his master. And that's why, because the master is paying for the, the master paid for the bride price, meaning to say the master, when he paid for the bride, he is also assuming the care, you know, to look after the basic needs of this woman. And so the master has certain responsibility. However, you know, God is, uh, God is a reasonable God. There's always options for this male servant to remain with his wife and children. So there are certain options. So if the, this male servant, he said, oh, I don't want to be away from my wife and my children. So what can he do? He, can, he has two options. One, after he's set free, this male servant, he can go out and find work and then earn enough money to redeem his wife and children. That's one option. Second option is what we read in verse 5. Verse 5. But if the servant declares, I love my master and my wife and children and do not want to go free, then his master's master must take him before the judges. He shall take him to the door or the doorpost and pierce his ear with an awl. Then he will be his servant for life. Okay, I'll talk more about this later. So this covers the section for 
male servants. Now, the female servant has slightly different set, set of laws. So what about the female servants? Verse 7, if a man sells his daughter as a servant, she is not to go free as the male servants do. If she does not please the master who has selected her for himself, he must let her be redeemed. He has no right to sell her to foreigners because you must keep her within the covenant community because he has broken faith with her. Verse 9, if he selects her for his son, not for himself, but for his son, he must grant her the rights of a daughter. If he marries another woman, he must not deprive the first one of her food, clothing, and marital rights. If he does not provide her with these three things, very specific, food, clothing, marital rights, she is to go free without any payment of money. Now, I'm not sure about the sisters or whoever reading this. You think, why is this so unfair? You know, Why can the male servant leave freely after the, after the six years? But why is it that when it's the woman's turn, you know, we cannot go free uh, at the seventh year? So here, one thing as you... I, I hope you, as you read through the verses, you realize that the way the woman is being sold as a servant is in a different manner from the man. Because if you observe the language or the, or the terms that uh, you read through the verses just now, you realize that this woman is not really sold for general purposes as an ordinary slave. You observe that Marriage is more in view here because you read things like, you know, uh, the master chosen her for who? For himself or if not for his son. And then, you know, if he's not pleased with her, he cannot sell her to foreigner because he has broken faith with her. Broken faith with her is like a marriage her language. And then, uh, you know, if he selects her for the son, he must, he must grant her the rights of a daughter, daughter-in-law. So it's, marriage is in view here. And so here, why is it that the woman, you know, they cannot, the woman servant cannot break free, cannot go free after six years? It's because if marriage is in view here, marriage is meant to be a lifetime commitment. It's not a contractual basis, you know, uh, get married for seven years and after that, after that leave. So God, since the beginning of time, marriage is meant to be a lifetime commitment. So it's not meant to be stopped after six years or, you know, seven years. So here, what we can see is, Perhaps the poor parents, you know, the parents in poverty of this female servant had sold her into marriage both as a way to pay for their debts and also as a way for her to find a husband. You know, you know sometimes you are poor, you, you may think that nobody wants to marry your, your daughter. So here is a two, two, you know, two purpose in one. So you can pay your debt, you can also secure a husband. If you still recall, you know, back in those days, a woman who is not married in the society is despised. So here, uh, when the parents cannot care, can no longer take care for the daughter, they try to, you know, they sell her, but also they try to find her a family, a husband to take care of her. And so here we see that uh, there are a few options for a female servant. He can be, she can become the wife of the master, the wife of the master's son, or if the master is not pleased, the master can allow the wife or the, the, the female servant to be redeemed. And so, again, God is not sexist. Huh? Um, when you read all these things, you need to, we need to understand that it's not unfair. Because if you read all this, you realize that in fact, although the woman cannot live after six years, the woman, uh, the female servant actually enjoy more rights than the male servant. Why do I say that? Because the law also say, if the woman is not being provided with three things, food, clothing, and marital rights. Now, marital rights, what is marital rights? Marital rights is not just, um, marital rights is not uh, just the right of, you know, having uh, sexual intercourse, but marital rights is the right to bear children. So if the, if the, husband, if the master or the son refused to give her the right to bear children, you know, back in those days, being able to bear children is something very great, very big for the woman. So if the master or the son refuses to give her the marital rights or food or clothing, she's free to go without any payment. So she also has certain rights. And so, and later on, you know, as we read in Deuteronomy chapter 15, over there, I, over there with some... Over there, there are some changes. Over there, you know, women also can leave after six years. 
But of course, I think that is in the context of if the woman is being sold for general slavery purposes, not for marriage. So we see, in fact, God takes care of the man and the woman. God is also uh, arranging such that a female servant who may be poor, she will have her rights to protection and care of her master. Okay, but back to this uh, Exodus chapter 21. Now, uh, we also see that God takes care of this female servant because, you know, once she belongs to either the master's son or the master, she's no longer a servant, you know, she's a family member. And so here we see that in, even in a society that values men more, God didn't forget the woman's right. But here, again, as we read this whole passage from verse 1 to 11 from this chapter 21, I'm not sure whether this tends to be a passage that most of us tend to skip over, you know, in our Bible reading. I don't know. Perhaps it's uh, some people you may you may think uh, some people they are not comfortable with the word slave or slavery, you know, because just as like I mentioned, if you read ESV and NASB Bible versions, you they use slave. So some people they are not comfortable with the word slave, so they just skip over. Other people they skip over this passage. Why? Because of relevance. They would think. What has Old Testament Hebrew slavery or slave or servants got to do with me and my modern day Christian living? What has it got to do with me? Because even in Singapore, hardly anyone calls somebody else slave, right? And you know, so some people also, when they come across this text today, they may also have this um, puzzle. You know, they will just question, why did God, the good God, even allow slavery in the past. So now, here I need to give you some background understanding on Hebrew slaves or Hebrew servants. Okay, so today, uh, even though I, I think we need to adjust our mindset pertaining to the, to the word slave. Why? Because I think in modern day context, I don't know about you, when I mention to you the word slave, what comes to your mind? You know, African slave being tortured very brutally in inhumane conditions, right? So today, very often, when we think of the word slave, we will associate slave to the inhumane African slave trade that was abolished in the 19th century. You know, over back in those days, in this uh, African slave trade, the Africans they were being kidnapped, you know, they were or they were being conned, and they were, and they were sold to foreign countries in very inhumane brutal ways and they are tortured by their masters and so on. But we need to realize and understand that the Hebrew servants or the Hebrew slave mentioned in the Bible is a different thing altogether. So here I mentioned, just now I mentioned already, the Hebrew word for servant, ibet, or this ibet can mean slave or servant. Or in modern day terms, it can mean a contract staff, contract. Only for a period, contract staff. It's like an employee, you know, employee. So the slave here is a total different connotation from the African slave trade kind of slave. So we need to understand how is it, how, what are some scenarios under which a Hebrew or rather an Israelite can become a slave? There are two main, uh, uh, there are two main ways uh, he, Israelites can become slaves. First, the most common reason why a Hebrew can become a slave is due to poverty and debts. You know, when the Israelites become poor, naturally, you know, people, when you become poor, you start to sell things. You sell your house, you, you, sell, you sell your livestock, until you sold everything and you have nothing else to sell, what's left to sell? Ourself. But it's in terms of our labor, not sell our body, but sell our labor. So those, those who are too poor, they finish selling everything, they, are, they only left with they themselves and their family whom they can sell uh, sell their labor. And so that's one way of becoming a slave voluntarily, you know, because, um, so, so that's one way. Another way to become a slave or a servant in the Israelite context is uh, when it is a penalty for wrongdoing. For example, we mentioned about stealing uh, example just now. So if a person steals something, he's supposed to make restitution. But if he has no money to make that restitution, the judge can sentence him to be sold, you know, to be sold. Uh, so just now, um, we read that, you know, in Exodus chapter 22, if, if you steal something and you cannot have any means to make restitution, you have to, you can, you can be sold to pay for the theft. 
And so we see another way of ending, ending up as a slave in the Israelite context is when you, you commit a crime. Okay, so these are the scenarios. But the question we are interested in is, how does God care for slaves or care for servants through his law? So from this short passage, 11 verses that we've just read in Exodus chapter 21, we noted one very important thing, that God cares even for the least in the society. Now, uh, I think I mentioned before, both the Ten Commandments and the Covenant Code, they are founded on the principle of loving God and loving men. And I don't know whether you find it amazing, you know, when God first talked about loving men, he started from the lowest class. I don't know when you read this whole thing and you, and you just think about the order in which God talks about all these matters. I don't know whether you find it amazing and wonderful because, you know, usually we forgot. You know, when, when you want to plan things, when, when you want to use your money, when you want to use your plan, your time, the last thing we think about is people of the lowest status, servant level. But you know, when God wants to highlight the importance of loving men, I mean, think about it. There's so many possible things God can talk about, right? When God wants to talk about uh, how, to, how to live out a proper conduct, God can talk about how do you love your family, how to love your friends, how to love your, ch your child. You know, God can talk about how to uh, manage money, uh, how to pursue a successful work or career. I mean, there's so many things that God can talk about in terms of living a proper life uh, as a child of God. But to think that God, in fact, begins with a group of people that is most easily forgotten by the society. I think that's very amazing. So although you may, at first look of this passage, you may feel like this is a passage not relevant to us. But as I read through this, I feel, isn't it so wonderful you know, that we are worshipping a God and we belong to a God who never even forget the least of the society. That means God will never forget us. Although there's no much reason for God to remember us. You know, sometimes I think about it, why should God remember me? Is there anything worthy in me that God should remember me? So even though there's no reason for God to remember us, to remember our need to care for us, God does. And that's the amazing things we, we see being displayed here. The Hebrew servants, they are the least of concerns maybe to other people in the society, but God didn't forget them. And I don't know when you read through the 11 verses, if you still haven't noticed yet. Now, just now we read 11 verses about Hebrew servant. Do you notice most of the laws, they concern who? They concern the interest of the master or they concern the interest of the servant? Amazing, right? In the 11 verses, I think um, maybe only the verse about the, the, the man's wife, the servant's wife cannot live with him. Only that protects the master. But all the rest of the other verses, in fact, the verses that we read just now, mostly protects the interests of the servants rather than the rights of the masters. And if you recall, you know, God, uh, just now in the responsive reading, we also read, God has been telling the Israelites one important thing, one important reason why the Israelites must treat their servants kindly. Why? If you read the Bible, do you know? Do you, do you recall what is the main reason why the Israelites should treat the servants kindly? The key reason is because the Israelites themselves have been slaves under the brutal hand of Pharaoh uh, in Egypt. And, but God keeps reminding his people, you have been slaves, but in my grace, I delivered you from Pharaoh's hand. So now you're supposed to treat your servants kindly with mercy. And so here, God is highlighting, just as he has been gracious to the Israelites, they are to be gracious and kind to their servants also. Now, isn't this the same message that God has been telling us? You know, sometimes we will be arguing with God, why should I care about this person? Why should I be gracious to my neighbor? But God always reminds us, you have been slave also. You have been slave to sin, to the devil, and I have delivered you. So what is it to you that now you, you just need to be a little bit, uh, a little bit kinder, more merciful to people around you? What is it so difficult? So God keeps reminding us in the same way he reminds the Israelites, you have been slaves. I graciously delivered you. Now you're supposed to be kind to your fellow men. Same thing for us. You have been slave to sin. You have been bound by the devil. I set you free and now you're supposed to love your neighbor. Be gracious to them. And so this, all these things ties back to God's main desire for his people Israelites 
and what is God's main desires for his, for his people? Be holy, because I, the Lord your God, am holy. And this is also the same exact desire God has for us. Be holy, because the God we worship is holy. And so here, when we see how God commands his people to take care of their servant, we can understand God's character and God's heart. Remember, remember I said right from the beginning, this covenant code is not just about a set of black and white rules. It, it points us to the heart, to the character of God, which we are supposed to emulate even today. And so as you read the Exodus chapter 21 on the laws concerning Hebrew servants, you realize that in fact, you know, even if you don't like the word or you don't like the concept of slavery, but the truth is God's laws are more protective of Hebrew servants than the pagan laws during that time, around that time. So why do I say that God's laws are more, more protective than, uh, than other nations' laws around that time? Because God, if you recall, one important thing that we keep reading is God restricts the term of servitude to only six years. So God says, you know, the Hebrew cannot be a servant for more than six years because God's idea is, uh, if a person serves the master for six years, this should be enough to pay for whatever debt the person owes. And another important thing is, no matter how a he uh, an Israelite is very poor, he still has a dignity as a member of the covenant community. Meaning to say, he's still a child of God. He's still a people of God. So yes, a, a child of God may have desperate moments. He may end up being poor in poverty, but he's still a, a people of God. So when God sets the limit, or a Hebrew can only be slave for a maximum of six years, that is to highlight, you know, ultimately, he's still to be respected. His position in the covenant community, his dignity in the covenant community, his rights in the covenant community must still be preserved. And so... That's why God says, you know, a Hebrew cannot be a servant permanently unless what? Unless the servant says, okay, I'm willing. Uh, and that's what we will talk about later. I'm will unless the servant himself is willing to serve the master forever. Otherwise, maximum of six years. And here, why is this, uh, why is this provision to, to be a servant and a good option, so to speak? Why? Because you just think about it. If a person is very poor, to be able to be a temporary and emphasize in God's terms is only temporary. To be able to be a temporary servant when we are poor, when a person is in poverty, is after all still better than being homeless, right? Than starving, right? I mean, I mean, if there's no such option to be a temporary servant, then I, I, I believe to the person who is very desperate in poverty. To be able to be a temporary servant of a master who can take care of him, give him a roof over the head, give him food, lodging, this is still better than to be roaming homeless in the street and starving. So this is an option. And so here, uh, God provides an avenue you know, that you know, those who are very poor, they can find a master. If someone is willing to buy them for a short while, at least they, they still can be taken care of for a period of time. And so because of this, uh, certain Israelites, they are willing to sell themselves temporarily because they need the food, they need the lodging. And some Israelites, when they find their masters, really good masters, they are even willing to commit to the master for the rest of their life. And so here, I'm not saying that, you know, I'm not saying that slavery is an honorable thing. But when we look at places in the Bible where slaves are mentioned, slavery is mentioned, we need to be very mindful that the the, the Hebrew kind of slavery that is mentioned in the Bible is different from the African slave trade that you know we are more privy to in the modern times. So it's different, and we must read that read it with uh, a more balanced perspective. And so here, uh, why do I say Israelite Israelites uh, servant laws are more humane than other people and other nations? Because why? One example is God's law. In fact, guards against cruelty against slaves. Because if we read on in Exodus chapter 21, verse 26, over here it says, An owner who hits a male or female servant in the eye and destroys it must let the slave go free to compensate for the eye. And an owner who knocks out the tooth 
of a male or female slave must let the slave go free to compensate for the tooth. And so notice the verses tell, tell us if a master is violent to his servant, such that the servant actually suffer real loss, like lose a teeth or lose an eye, then this master must let the servant go free. And so in other words, such laws guards against what? Guards against the abuse of the slave. And again, I mentioned, this is exactly opposite from the brutal handling of um, the slave trade that we, are, we may know or we may be associating that with. And so it's totally different from the brutal African slave trade. This law, in fact, protects against the abuse of servant. And also just now, if you recall, uh, I didn't put the verse here, but just now when we read responsive reading in Deuteronomy chapter 15, over there it says that when uh, the servant can go free at the seventh year, the master cannot just let the servant go empty-handed. But the, but the master must what? Give the servant generously. So you see, God takes care of the slave the master, or the servant. Another example that shows how God's law actually protects the rights of slaves is in Deuteronomy chapter 23. You know, over there in ancient Israel, if a slave uh, so choose to escape from the master, it's actually there's a ref it's very lenient, you know, because if a slave escapes from the master, the law of God says, you must not return that slave, that runaway slave, back to the master. Leave him alone. You know, let him be. So Deuteronomy chapter 23, verse 15. Here it says, If a slave have, has taken refuge with you. Now in the ESV version, it's uh, translated, If the slave has escaped from his master, you know, and then taken refuge with you. So, so it means if the slave has escaped from his master, do not hand them over to their master. Let them live among you wherever they like. Wow, so nice, wherever they like, in whatever town they choose. Do not oppress them. Wow, so this law is almost like saying, wow, if a slave run away, he's not to be pursued, he's not to be punished. And so you see, with, with such kind of laws uh, that protects the servant and protects the slave more than the masters, it actually makes it's not so attractive to be a master, right? You, if, just imagine if you're the master, you'll be thinking, oh, yo, my slave can anyhow run away. I cannot pursue him and nobody is supposed to return him to me. And anyhow, he like, he just not happy, he can run away. So, so although there's this six years term, uh, I mean, this kind of law, when it's set in place, a, a servant who suddenly don't like it, even within the six years, he run away. But he's not to be caught. So actually, God's law protects the servant more than the master and God so we see you know from all these laws that God has set for Hebrew servants we see that the kind of slavery that the good God allow in Israel is only a form of temporary humane form of servitude and so it's very different from the brutal slave trade that we often heard about and it's also very different from the kind of slavery that the Israelites themselves suffered under the hand of the Pharaoh in Egypt. So this is something we need to distinguish. And do not just think, oh, why is there slavery in the Bible? So next time if people talk to you, how come your God, the Christian God, allows slavery? You must, we must explain to them it's a different kind. But still, you know, despite I point out the differences, still some people will ask, but then why doesn't the good God abolish slavery totally in the Old Testament? So first, with regard to this, we must really understand one important thing, that the truth is God and Moses, they did not institute slavery in Israel. Meaning to say, God didn't say, thou shalt have slave. God didn't institute slavery. So, but the thing is, God has laws about slavery to constrain slavery, uh, to ensure that masters, will not treat their servants in an inhumane way. And God's laws on slavery is to prevent exploitation of the master. So this is, and when I talk about this, I think some of you may link this to another kind of law, which is uh, the laws on divorce, right? When you, if you still recall, uh, when Jesus talked about 
divorce, and, or when Jesus was questioned about divorce laws, Jesus mentioned, you know, yes, Moses permitted divorce, but it's only as a form of concession because the people's heart were hard, right? Not because God desired divorce. And so same thing for slavery. God may not like slavery, but at this point in time, God may allow that as a form of concession. But we need to understand, you know, when there's laws, it doesn't mean God approve of that. Just like, you know, later on, during, later on in the covenant code, we will read about laws concerning what? We will read about laws concerning assaults, theft. But again, I said, when there's a law on something, it doesn't mean that God approved that thing. Because we will read a lot of laws about against a theft, against a manslaughter, against things that God doesn't like. And so we need to understand that when there's a law about something, it doesn't mean that God condones those things. But God actually sets those laws to restrain evil. Because you think about it, usually there's no need to set law to restrain good things, right? I mean, what for you set laws to restrain good things? You don't see people set laws on you. Know, there's a maximum of 10 times you must forgive another person. There's no maximum. You know, if you want to do something good, they didn't say there's a law, you know, there's a maximum of uh, you can only lend $10,000 to someone else. No, there's no law about the maximum good you can do. You just do the more the merrier good. If it's virtues, the more the merrier. Just like, you know, if you recall, you, you read about the fruit of the Holy Spirit in Galatians chapter 5, right? Uh, you know, the love, the joy, the patience, the kindness. And what does the whole list end with when you talk about the fruit of the Holy Spirit? Against such things, there is no law. So against love, against um, forbearance, against kindness, why do you need to set a law to limit those things? There's no need. But it's exactly evil. You need to set laws to restrain, to limit, to constrain those evil. So in fact, the, tr the fact that God had to give laws concerning slavery, it means that slavery may not be such a good thing after all. That's why there need to be some regulations, there need to be some laws to minimize the potential damage and hurt that slavery may, may cause. And so there's a need for laws to prevent abuse and exploitation. And so here, we need to recognize, doesn't mean that God approves slavery, but God allows it for certain reasons. You know, just as like I mentioned, it's better to be serving some masters than to roam around in the streets uh, starving. But God sets in rules to restrain people from exploiting pe servants who are poor or desperate. But now, after understanding God's uh, reasons, we have to also consider one important thing that we read from the passage today, and that is voluntary permanent servitude. We read there, you know, that um, after six years, if the servant who has a wife and child, children, the servant can choose not to leave the master after six years so that he serve his masters permanently. Now you just ask, okay, this is permanent servitude, but it's voluntary. Then you just ask, isn't it very strange? If a person can go free, why do he want to voluntarily stay on? You know, why would anyone want to do that? I mean, you have a freedom, but you don't want to say, oh, sorry, I don't want my freedom. I want to stay with you and continue to be servant for the rest of my life. Why would anyone want to give up freedom and cheerfully, not helplessly, cheerfully, not helplessly, stay on to serve his master? So a very likely reason could be, you know, the, the servant taught it through and then the servant thing, you know, concluded that, oh, my master have treated me well, uh, provided me with food, with a roof, with clothing, even with wife and children. So he reckoned that he will fare better under the care of the master than to go and work elsewhere or to venture out on his own. So maybe that's why he decided, you know, to stay with the master. And just now we read, this is not a simple decision. So to ensure that the, master, the servant didn't anyhow make this decision, he's supposed to be brought to the door, right, or doorpost, and have his ear pierced with an awe. So it's a painful, it's a public ceremony to ensure that the servant really thought it through, you know, this commitment. He really wants to commit to the master for the rest of his life. It's not a joke, you know. It's, he has to be brought to the elders. There's witnesses. It's a public event. And so here... But when we read about this, when we want to try to understand uh, why would anyone forego their, their freedom to serve this master forever, 
we need to understand why. So let's revisit um, this verse 5. We read, there's one interesting phrase in verse 5. I don't know whether when you read verse 5, do you see where is the interesting phrase? Okay, here it says, if, but if the servant declares, I love my master and my wife and my children and do not want to go free. Okay, then you know, then you know, he'll be brought there and he'll be master for life. Okay, so when you first read about this, uh, you first will think, why so cruel, you know? In order to stay with the wife and children, he must, he must sacrifice his um, freedom forever. I mean, when you first read this, it's like, he has no choice. I, why, do I, why would I want to be with my master forever? Because I want to be with my wife and my children. So at first look, this may seem like a very cruel regulation. But notice that interesting phrase. And anyone, you know, when you ask, and when you, you are, if you are asked, why would the servant stay on permanently? The common answer given will be, because he wants to stay with the wife and the children. But that's not all the verse says, right? Because the verse had this very important phrase, even before he says, I love my wife and my children. Before he even says, I love my wife and children, notice he say, first, I love my master. When I read this, I feel this is so amazing because my common sense, if I were him, I think I would choose to stay on for the family. But here, he didn't even mention the wife and children first. He mentioned the, the master first. I love my master. Of course, I mean, naturally, it's very expected, very natural for him to love the wife and children. That, that goes without saying. But the amazing and interesting, thing, noteworthy thing is, he says, I also love my master. And that's why I'm willing to stay on. So meaning to say, the servant is willing to stay on because he loves the master, not because he has no choice. This is very important. Eh? This is very important. He loves his master, not because he has no choice. And by saying that he loves his master, it also means he can sense this master is a good master. He has taken good care of me. And he will also take good care of my family because you just think about it. If he stays on, his family will stay on with him, right? Because naturally they will be together. If he's a permanent servant, likely the whole family will be with him. But he is willing to stay on cheerfully because he recognized that the master is good for him. Good to him and good for him. Now, after hearing all these things, the, the question I, I think all of us will ask ourselves is, Okay, I, I think God is good with the Hebrew servant and Hebrew servant willing to stay with the master forever. Okay, but what's that got to do with us? You know, I'm not a servant. I'm not a slave. I don't have a master to report to. But what, I'm not Hebrew. I'm not Israelite. What has all this got to do with me? Okay, so here we need to realize that when we, when we look at all these laws on servant, we must also not forget that who says we are not servant? Who says we are not slave? Uh, in fact, after we are born again, we are servants of Christ. We used to be slave to sin. We used to be the servant of the devil. But now, we are the servant of Christ. And now, as we read about this voluntary permanent servitude of this Hebrew servant, we need to ask ourselves this important question that, are we like this Hebrew servant who is committed to serve his master forever? Meaning to say, can we say, you know, can we say, I love my master. You know, just now the Hebrew servant. I love my master. I love my wife. I love my children. But I love my master. So I want to stay on to serve you. Can we say the same thing that I love my master and my Lord Jesus such that I'm willing to be his permanent servant? So this is a very important thing for us to think through. Do we realize how kind... Yeah, just like I mentioned, the reason why the Hebrew servant wants to stay on is because he saw his Hebrew master is a good master. How about us? Have we realized that our God, whom we serve, has been a very kind master to us, such that it will do us good, it will serve us better if we remain with him than we are to go elsewhere to find other master? I mean, how can we not love such a master like our Lord Jesus Christ? He suffered, he died for our sins, and he showered endless grace upon us. And what's, what's more than that? I mean, God has been good. But on the other hand, we very often have been unworthy, lazy servant of Christ. I mean, if Christ didn't mind us, if God didn't mind us that we from time to time keep, keeps opposing Him, keeps forgetting Him, keeps sinning against Him, and keeps uh, withholding our good things from Him, being lazy, if God, the good master, didn't mind us, didn't mind to keep 
us such an undeserving servant, who are we to say, oh God, I don't want to serve you, you know, you're not deserving of my time, you're not deserving of my worship. I mean, if God didn't, if God didn't despise us, who are we to say, oh God, I don't want to serve you anymore? So very often, you know, we sometimes we need to consider if we choose not to follow God anymore, we are not just ungrateful, we are foolish at the same time. Because which master can be better than God? I mean, if you say, oh, I don't want to save I don't want to serve God anymore. Where else can we find a better husband? Will the devil be a better husband? Less, uh, uh, I mean, will the de devil be loving? Will the devil be not brutal, not cruel? Or, or can we ourselves, can ourselves be a better master of our life? I mean, naturally we know, cannot. We cannot even control tomorrow. We have no capability to plan the best things for ourselves. So if that's the case, we need to come to a conclusion like this Hebrew servant. I love you, my master, and I want to serve you for the rest of my life. And this is just like um, Peter's profession. You know, just now I we read in the responsive reading, you know, there was once when uh, when Jesus was preaching and many disciples started to leave Jesus. Because Jesus said, you know, you have to eat my flesh, drink my blood. You know, people start to find him very weird. People start to leave him. And then, and then he asked his disciples, just now we asked, but just now we read in responsive. He asked the twelve, are you going to leave me also? And remember Simon Peter's response? Simon Peter said this very important word, and I pray this is our profession also, that Simon Peter said, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the, eter the words of eternal life. Now, if we are like Peter, we recognize that there's no other one who can give us eternal life. There's no other place we can find the truth. There's no better love and goodness we can source. Then it will do us good to cling on to Jesus with our dear life. And so today, I want to leave you with, with this question. Do we love Christ so much that we, are, that we desire to serve Him forever? So this is something we need to think about. I mean, of course, God will, not, God will not let us go. But it's about our heart of following Him. Is it with a cheerful servitude? Or we just, I don't know, seems like following Him like as if we have no choice. So we need to really ask and confirm for ourselves. What is the greatest comfort a person can have in his life? What is the greatest comfort? If you think through everything, the greatest comfort a human can have is to be able to belong to a master who loves us, who cares for us, who provides for us, who dies and comes back to life for us, who uses us, who is with us forever. Such a good master to the extent that we can cheerfully say, Master, I don't want to leave you. I want to be taken care of by you. I want to serve you for the rest of my life. So it's indeed, I pray every one of us can see that it is wonderful grace to be able to be taken care of by Jesus for the rest of our life and through eternity. And I pray that God also give us this thankfulness uh, to be grateful to this undeserved privilege that God has given us to serve Him so that from the bottom of our heart, we are able to serve Him cheerfully. And with that, let us go to God in prayer. Dear Lord Jesus, we want to thank you for receiving us as your children and also as your servant. Lord, thank you for setting us free from what binds us in the past, sins, uh, devil, curses. Lord, we thank you for setting us free. But Lord, we know that our freedom is to serve a better master. It's not to be free on our own because we are never good on our own. So Lord, we pray that you touch our heart today with your love, with your word, to see the wonderful blessings, to be able to belong to you, to serve you. And Lord, we also pray that since we have been slaves and you have set us free, you help us to emulate your merciful heart, to be kind to people around us, even people of lower status, even people uh, who, are, who may be at the status of servants, who may be our staff, who may be lower than us. Lord, we pray that you help us love them with the love you have showered us. You help them, you help us to sh live out the love that can set us apart from the world. So Lord, we thank you and we pray in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Mm -hmm.